reading his lips. <laughs> I can see through the window. And that is all. What are we doing with that old hippie, Buzzy Linhart, opening up our show? Transport is my theme, but we got my friend Buzzy Linhart. Old hippies, Dr. Wood. Are you an old hippie? I was an old hippie. Okay, and Carolyn I'm Rosen. I'm a little younger than that. I was, in that I was in that era, Joe. You're right. I used then to how be... do you put up with an old hippie? Well, we both have kind <laughs> of the same social justice bent, so it, it kind of matched uh, what we were doing, and we also were both in theater, uh, which is where we met. I was a dancer at one time, uh, and a friend of yours, Joe, uh, Steve Nelson. Future old, guest. Future guest, future Steve guest. Nelson. When you tell me when he comes in, I'd like to see him. I haven't seen him in 40 years. You know he's out in the Berkshires or something. And oh, that's, I thought he was up in, the, up in uh, Gloucester area. No, he's out in the Berkshires now. That's why it's uh, oh. Western Mass. So when he's, in the, when he's in the neighborhood, he's going to drop in, and I will call you. Okay. But today is October 8th, uh, 2010, and it's a Friday afternoon, and my friends... Dr. William Wood and Carolyn Rosen are here, and the topic today, we could talk about all sorts of things, but GLAM, Green Line. I especially want to know, and I'm going to open this by saying, I, I go to the concerts in Boston, I went to Ringo Starr, mm -hmm. and I got on the Silver Line. And so here's where I'm coming from with the whole Green Line thing, and maybe you can enlighten us all, but the Silver Line has a dedicated road, but it's actually like a bus. Correct. And, and you go to the, it takes you right to the concert hall, and I'm wondering, like, wow, isn't there a room enough near the Amtrak to build a parallel track for a kind of green line bus, silver line bus, that can then split off into Medford Square onto the main roadway? Would that make sense? Oh, well, anything makes sense in regards to that. But uh, the green line um, actually started because of a mitigation lawsuit that the Conservation Law Foundation brought against the state back before the big dig started oh. and it was part of yep. uh, essentially the mitigation to say that if we spend this much money on highway systems we need to be guaranteed that there's other air quality benefits that are going to be provided outside of just the Boston area. We have to meet the Air Quality Clean Air Act. And so they sued the state and the, the Green Line, which I think had been on plans for many, many years and just never really took on a life, um, took on a life with this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, got involved in the Green Line because uh, it was a, uh, there was a group uh, called the Beyond Lechmere Study Group, um, who had some representation of Medford, but um, not many people really knew who these folks were. And they were pushing for the Green Line to come to West Medford. Um, essentially, the lawsuit had it only coming to Ball Square in Somerville. And this group, who we didn't believe was as representative of the full Medford community, pushed for it to come to West Medford Square, which, if you're familiar with West Medford Square is pretty congested um, and has the commuter rail coming down the uh, area uh, I, as well. Joe, exactly. Joe, I was, I was asked by my uh, neighbors on uh, the streets up in, in West Medford, a year, oh, about two, it's got to be four or five years ago now. They would say, Bill, do you know anything about this? And I'd say, I don't know anything about the Green Line. And I found the board. And I asked these, the people who have lived there for 20, 25, 35, 40, 50, 60 years who these people were. Now, Medford, as you probably know, is a pretty, because um, you live there, is pretty much we all know each other. I mean, if we don't know you personally, we know of you. Well, even though there's 60,000 people, people or so, right, it's 55,000. It's a small atmosphere. town atmosphere. But when they asked me, I said, well, what do you, what's the problem? They said, we want to put the Green Line up into West Medford Square. And we said, well, why do you want to go to West Medford Square? Number one, at the time, we had money in the state coffer, but it still would have cost five, almost a million dollars to cross over the river, protect the river. I'm an environmentalist. I'm not the screaming jump out there, but I do believe in the environment. I said, oh, what would it create to the uh, Mystic River? 
we got that question. And I, we got that to ask. Then what would it do to the community? There was actual house taking uh, that would have had to happen to get to make the uh, tracks larger, to make the right away larger, and to move the tracks over uh, to the right or to the left. And they would have had to take down quite a few houses. If you go down to the track, quite now, a few, 12, 20. Oh, I don't know. I don't have a number. Probably 15. That's somewhere. And that's they would have had to grab them. Displacement. And they would have had yeah. to grab. You know the old studio with Channel 3 was? Yeah, 40 They had to grab that too. And that's where it was going, directly behind that area. Now, which is parallel almost to the tracks. Yes, are, what, what they're going to be doing is they're planning to move the commuter rail to, if you're. Well, that's the end result. Yeah. Well, let's get to the, the history. So we said to, if you don't mind, do you mind? No. Okay. So the history was we, we started that, and then all of a sudden we stopped them. We stopped them at West Medford. Wasn't an intent to stop them at West Medford. We couldn't figure a way where they could actually turn the track around. Well, what they were going to do was take place at Park to turn the tracks around. Well, many more neighbors and the soccer teams and every and the baseball teams all went out and said, "We don't want place at Park taken." That quite frankly helped the issue out. So they went back to Route 16, which is on the other side of the uh, tracks and the river. And to answer your question, yes, it would be very easy to do what your suggestion is by putting a bus. But they did not recommend bus service. They recommended the five people, one who worked for the MBTA under contract, uh, the five people who were, had a conflict of interest, uh, to, decided for the whole city of Medford, without the whole city of Medford knowing about it, that they would go to Route 16. Now, when we found out, we were, well, why are you going to Route, route 16? Meaning Boston Ave area. Boston Ave area, right. Boston Ave and Route 16. The mandate from the courts was only to the hillside. So then they decided to say that Route 16, which that sliver is Somerville, was Medford Hillside. Now, you want to take it from there, Carol? You can get more of it. Yeah, so the issue is that um, we then took, uh, had started writing about it in the paper and saying to folks, these are the kind of the things you need to think about because it's not just about being a transportation project. Um, it's about urban development that they're trying to wrap around this. And so there were a lot of folks. We went to meetings. There were advocacy groups that were holding meetings. We went. Um, they wouldn't allow really the community to speak. There were a lot of elderly who live up in that area who had many questions. Obviously, they lived along the track area. And uh, this group was really just denying them the ability to ask questions and get answers. Um, they were more, their agenda was more around the advocacy as opposed to really looking at the larger picture impacts and mitigation issues and what does this mean to the community at large. Any discussion? So, uh, yeah, it, it was basically it's going to come and you to kind of deal with it and so we had a lot of people come together who had uh, read a lot of our writings in the paper about um, the issues that the city should consider and asked us to come together as a group to help work with the uh, butters and other folks in the community to really um, make the process more transparent, um, disclosure, and also to act as a watchdog. So we created the Green Line Advisory Group for Medford. It's an educational group, which a lot of folks misinterpret. Um, you know, people, I think, are used to uh, us and them mentality. Mm -hmm. And we were more, we're not against public transportation, but we do feel that you have to deal with the realities of what does a project like this mean to the quality of life of a community. There were issues around the disability community, um, of which Dr. Wood is a, a strong advocate in Medford. In the, in the sense that the MBTA had for a number of years not had accessible transportation. There is a disability uh, lawsuit settlement. Um, that has been out there that the disability community won and we were questioning why are we spending money on a system when you haven't even got the old system 
um, up and running, fully accessible to people with disabilities. Um, there was also the issue of the um, environmental justice community in West Medford. And for the state and federal government, they define environmental justice as folks who are minorities, um, folks who have second language, uh, low-income folks. Um, and the reason they call them environmental justice is because a lot of times those folks take on the environmental burden of projects. Um, like, for example, I think down south they've had a lot of issues where chemical plants get put into, say, a minority oh. community. And so they're bearing the burden of the environmental issue. So for the West Medford community, which is one of the, the most historic African American communities in the country. And the oldest. And the, the oldest. oldest African American Truly. Yes. in the United States. In fact, they Middle just class. did a project at Tufts um, recently with um, the African American community in West Medford to document a lot of the history and some of the very prominent folks who have come out of that the community. The question comes out uh, uh, out of this is at that point, will we destroy this historical community? Now, when you talk to African Americans, they, in that community, they'll come up and say, but what are you talking about? What project, the E-Green Line? We weren't informed about this. Now, remember, we're talking two or three years ago now. And we'd say, well, according to uh, a group that uh, is in Medford who supports this, they've talked to you and you've all agreed to it. We never agreed to anything like that. So we said to ourselves... Are there group leaders in West Medford? I would rather not, uh, uh, you mean group leaders of the African American community? African American community and other communities. Oh, Are there leaders yeah, that they're, you're they're, talking to sure. that represent yes, a block sure. of people? There were, uh, I'll use just one example, Gwen Blackburn. Gwen Blackburn's a, uh, known for a while. She's a nice uh, woman. A nice woman. Uh, she'd been an African American leader of that community for many years. Her husband, Felix, is on the uh, traffic commission, and he was would bring it up. He was also a former... Uh, state uh, uh, um, uh, uh, civil rights, civil rights leader, a uh, person who did affirmative action. He also worked for universities on affirmative action. I, I say that because down the road this is very important to think about. You have a man who has been doing most of his life affirmative action for people of color, uh, people who spoke differently, and disabilities. So he had been doing this stuff for many, many years. He said, we've never been informed of any of this. What's going on? We held a meeting uh, in the church to say whether this should be, and invited the state, invited uh, our state representatives and our state senator, who, by the way, would not support us. Did not support the idea that education should come out of this prior to forcing this down people's throats. Was this, this the church up near um, the library? Up near the library? I went to a meeting. No, at, uh, no, no, no. This was at, uh, right smack in West Medford okay. at the um, uh, Baptist Church. Uh, oh, um, I think it's called the Baptist Church. Uh, not the Shiloh Baptist. Yeah, the Shiloh Baptist. Not the, no, not the Shiloh. The other one. I can't remember the, which one. I uh, only no, bring it up because I attended a meeting up there near the library. But like I said, I'm still not well versed. I'm really thankful yeah. you're here. Yep. telling me the stuff well, well, what, in the audience as what well. What happens is uh, a group of people who hadn't lived in the city f for more than five to ten years had made all these decisions. And the not knowing that the African-American community that had been there. So we had a group, we had a meeting with this group and organized the people of West Medford, African-American and disabled, uh, to come. We filled the room. It was 95 degrees that May, the middle of summer, no air conditioning, and the, and the windows stayed open. And people, obviously, if they were there, they wanted to hear. They yeah. wanted to hear they wanted and, to they, learn. and they agree. We took a, a kind of a, a, a straw poll, and a good 95% of them did not want it. Then we were approached. Did not want school. What, coming to 16 or coming Route to West 16. Medford? They didn't want to come to Route 16 because they were afraid that it would uh, cause a lot of traffic, a lot of parking, and gentrification uh, in West Medford, and meaning that 
uh, like Somerville, Davis Square. A lot of people love Davis Square. Don't mind. Don't mind saying. I it's remember about that project too. Right. That yes. Took right. a lot of time. Well, Davis Square, uh, the the when the uh, red line came in there, it didn't affect it for ten years later until about ten years later when uh, rent control went out of business, and then in Cambridge. Then all of these Cambridge people came over and said, well, we don't want to buy houses in Cambridge. They're too expensive. Let's go to Davis Square. Well, it was a feast or famine. They bought houses low, put money into them, and they got them worth millions of dollars now. Some of those houses are worth lots more money than they ever would have been. Because of the Because, on, the because of line. the red line. The red line was easy to communicate. But did you really service the people of Davis Square? Who was it you serviced? You service the people who moved in because everything else left out. They weren't there. Uh, 20 years ago, most of those people weren't there. But So the same thing has happened in the West End. It's happened at Kendall Square. It happened at Davis Square. And all of these groups of people in West Medford. By the way, many of the West Medford African-American community came from Cambridge where they were displaced out of Cambridge. Many of the white uh, community, which we found poor white, uh, low income white, lived in Somerville, which we were knocked out of Davis Square and went into this. We, we met them all in this project. So here we are in this project saying, wait a minute, none of these people have been, in, been told about what you are trying to develop. And many of them had homes along the line um, yep. because to get back to your one question, Joe, they were going to move, the plan was to move the commuter rail to if you were coming, say, out of Medford or uh, out of Winchester and you're coming towards Route 16, okay. the commuter rail would be moved to your left, which means that you have an elderly housing program there, you have Whole Foods and so forth. We're more concerned about the, uh, the Walkland Court housing program that's there, which has a lot of African American and disability population and low income living there. And then the green line would go in on the other side and then there'd be a buffer between the two because it's federally required. So the tracks right behind this high school here would stay the same but then they would veer off somewhere. Not here. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, the, the, the low line. was here, yes. yes. It would veer off. But, but what would happen, and this is what would happen that the West Medford people, the pe there are a lot of people in Walkland Court who are lived there all their lives in West Medford. And they would, they're now elderly or they're disabled and they would have to be moved because they were going to wind up actually poisoning. And these are the studies. We go out, we look up, by the way, we got uh, Dr. Marlene Warner, who was one of the foremost uh, biologists in the country. She put the first biology project up in space for a woman. She's a friend of mine. I asked her to look at their study. And she said, where's this? Where's that? Where's this? She had helped create EPA. Here we have the, one of the foremost EPA people saying, where's the studies? This is a bunch of garbage. And she said it in her comments to them. This is a bunch of garbage. She then called her friends at Harvard who said, this is a bunch of garbage. That's when we started to get some action because it wasn't what the federal government was asking for. It wasn't what the state government was asking for. But they did follow after that, but the, the rules of what they were asking for. But there was other things that came up during the process of 10 years. For instance, the, to tell them about the particle problem. In well, there's been several studies, and, and again, the reason why GLAM exists is to educate and push these issues, and the only reason these issues were are being addressed or being pushed is because we forward. But there's, uh, as Dr. Woods mentioned, that a study, there's a California EPA study that talks about diesel particulate and the carcinogens and the uh, precancerous um, 
causing of early death issues around uh, diesel particulates. And as you know, with the commuter rail, it's all diesel. So as you move those closer to f someone's home, mm. um, the particulates actually will be heavier against those homes that are there. Plus, it'll go out even further beyond the neighborhood. I don't um, even think of that while driving the commuter well, rail. Would you believe, would you believe, and Carolyn will verify this out, that there was a study done in California, Pennsylvania, and one other, and I can't think of the other city, area. Each one of them said the same thing. The population that will be hurt the worst will be the African-American population. I don't know why, but they, they said that, that they would be the first ones to be hit by these, I called it. Yeah, they're more the at-risk population. At-risk population, along with children and disabled people. Well, guess who lived there now? The African-American, of course, children, and the disabled population. So you're ta talking about either moving them out, forcing them out, or killing them. Now, the state hates to re recognize that these studies are out there, and the federal EPA right now are studying whether they should, should uh, uh, exclude or include this uh, need for these studies. Uh, and it's been some of the work that, that Glam has done and some of the work that Marlene has done that has brought this to a, a, a kind of a, wait a minute here, you're going to build something that's going to go from Leechmere all the way to Route 16, Boston Ave, with children all up and down that route, as well as West Medford, where children and African Americans... This is information they do not want to hear. Oh, no, they don't tell us. Well, I mean, if we're living in a world where the BP oil spill is on our TV screen, and we're being lied to by everyone involved... Yes. And we're seeing it, who are you going to believe, your eyes or them? Yeah, it's yeah, a question. And, yes. But this, I read the Medford Mass Group, I read the transcript, I read the Daily Mercury. I'm not well-versed on this until, you, you know, you're sitting here with me, and which is important because now our whole audience in Somerville and Boston can actually hear this show. This is important stuff. You know, when you said environmental about the people, I thought you were talking about geese and wildlife. Well, that's another issue that also comes along with the Green Line because from College Ave up to Route 16, um, there is a lot of woodland area, so there are animal habitats and so forth. Okay. So that's another issue that our uh, butters have brought up to us because, one, having a woodland area has, has given the, uh, the quality of life of, of a field that kind of blocks the noise from the commuter rail, um, acts as a barrier to some of the diesel particulates. Uh, we actually did a show about three years ago where um, we filmed an abutter and the kind of quality of life issues they dealt with around the, the commuter rail and uh, she had a cat bow in the yard Wait, and it uh, was completely um, particulate uh, covered with diesel while particulate. While we were sitting there, yes. while we were filming, which we spent two or three hours filming each place and you know how long it takes to film outside and get and the shot right it. and mm. edit it and you know, you know the, whole, the whole spiel. So while we were there, we watched a bowl of uh, cat water. water. Not cat water, go from clean to completely black while we were there. Her roof, the side of the roof, was completely black from these so-called particulates. Now, did a train go by, or was it just in the it air was, and It was in down? the air coming down, Plus and the trains, trains come by. by. And it stays up in the air because it's very, very light. It's very and it goes, fine. And go, it will go according to Marlene Wana and I'm not an expert on this stuff, go at least one mile at the very least and three miles uh, maximum. So you've got particulates that would go from, uh, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm trying to guess what three miles. Right to the Mystic Lakes? Well, we're all over the Mystic Lakes. You're going to have in the Mystic Water, Mystic uh, River. Because that train goes right by the Mystic Lakes sure. anyway, so it's not three miles, it's yeah. just a half a mile. Yeah. Folks don't realize that diesel particulate causes, uh, can cause cancerous uh, issues. It causes asthma. 
Um, and, uh, you know, especially if you've got young children who've got young lungs that can be very damaging. So Governor Patrick had a reform bill that he did around transportation that has called for health studies in, in certain areas. Now, most folks think of it more around emissions around uh, cars, but uh, diesel particulates from trains is actually much more severe. And so we were calling for a health study. That was one of the things that we were calling for because we said um, if you're going to do an environmental project, which the Green Line is supposed to do, and again, I think folks need to understand it's around regional air quality. It's not around the local air quality. And, and M MassDOT has already admitted in some of their environmental reports that in the area there will be pockets that actually increase pollution versus decrease because they're only looking at um, the regional area. So when we're looking at diesel trains, we're saying we want a health study because, um, and based on the advice of Dr. Warner, that there needs to be some sort of cancer um, cluster study to see what the problems have been there. And we're saying because it's a total environmental issue that we should be looking at retrofitting these trains, if you're going to be moving them closer to residential homes, that we need uh, to see retrofitted engines that are more um, filtered around the diesel particulates. And on the low line, I believe there's very few trains right now that are retrofitted. So the ones you see going every day, and I ride it every day myself, um, those are not uh, filtered, and so diesel comes it's out. Just dirty old trains. Dirty old. Yeah. But you know, that's only one subject on it. There are, there are other subjects that, some are funny. Uh, I'll give you one, what I consider one of the funniest subjects. I went to a meeting, a workshop meeting, as what they called uh, EOT at the time, board member. They, I was appointed by the mayor to be, represent the city of Medford. Well, the people, the new people who didn't know me got up and said I didn't represent Medford, even though the mayor appointed me. And even though I get elected in a political party to represent people in the city of Medford, I, I was shocked. I was shocked. That's how far it, it got to be humorous. I went to a, a workshop where I was sitting across people who were talking about bike paths. Nothing wrong with bike I'm not against bike paths, by the way. Nothing wrong with They're it. They're kind of nice. They're nice. They're good people from here to there. But it, what about the disabled person in a wheelchair, doesn't he, he or she deserve the same rights as a bicycle, especially motorized ones? What about the person who drives a tricycle and has no, uh, no feet, legs and uses his, his hands? What about the cane walker who wants to do a walk path there? What, and they weren't even talking about that. So I, 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 Now, they argued with me about the idea of having that. Then I pulled out, which a friend of mine named Joe Vigaloni helped me do one time. Do you remember Joe? Hi, Joe. Uh, the funny part was I pulled out a study and said the United States government would not accept funding any of this because you're making it a bike path and not a community path. They did not. These are community. These are the bike path people. They didn't understand that there were rights that they had to follow along that line that said you must make this accessible to everybody. Five years later, four years later, three years later, something like that, after that workshop, McGill, the university up in uh, Montreal uh -huh. who started bike paths, they put out a study said bike paths don't do any good at changing the environment. People who drive cars still continue to drive cars. Right. People who wanted bikes still drive bikes. Once in a while, you'll get a walker who will go out and buy a bike. Now, the question comes down, the humorous part of this is, are we building for a group of people who are not here and trying to encourage these people, which supports the argument that, that West Medford African Americans bring up, you're going to push us out of our homes, or are we building this and wasting money because there is no real change going to happen? That was one of the reasons they started, supposedly, to start this. And these kinds of ambiguous arguments are constantly brought up. 
Carolyn can tell you more about some of those. But don't you see the lack of logic in so much of this? Just for an example, we now have those um, compactors with the solar energy, the, the trash bins. Right. Yes. And I've been saying for years, why not solar energy? And, and you could have, the, what did the train start with? Steam engines. What if you had solar energy powered steam engines, right? And everything's clean. And then you don't have that problem. But people don't go from logic. They go for whatever the, uh, the greed comes in and whoever has the conflict, who, whomever is controlling things, it just seems in every walk of life. Well, here's the other humorous part. We just talked about the environmentalist, the environmental problem that this is solved. The group that started this, the Conservation Law Foundation lawyers, who claim this was for environmental, do not want to hear the fact that this is happening that these diesel trains are filthy. It does not want to clean the air quality up in Medford, but wants to clean, clean the uh, air quality up in Boston, which none of this is going to work for them. Yet we're going to spend a uh, billion dollars on building it and probably a billion dollars on mitigation it. How do you get people to um, not only get the information, but to actually be like-minded and say, hey, this is for everyone. This helps everyone. Instead of like the, there, there seems to be a big battle. Like you well, said, us versus them. It's, I that's think why we started the group. Because in, in that group, by the way, we have Democrats. We have Republicans. We have disabled people. We have African Americans. We have people who support the Green Line. We have people who don't support it at all. People who support it stopping in at Ball Square. People who so everyone's to in it just to, to learn. Well, we're, our primary was to start educating people around these issues, and again, that we had diverse people who were bringing out their various concerns. But I think, Joe, that you hit on the point of power and control. And the biggest issue I see around the Green Line is that you have folks who have an agenda that they want the Green Line. And I think they sent a signal to the state that um, it's like being a poor businessman where you say you want to negotiate something, um, you want something and you go to negotiate, you basically send the signal that you will uh, accept anything to get what you want. And what our position has been is that we're not against the Green Line. We can see the benefit of public transportation, but this project is much wider than that. It's around land use and development and economic development. When you start getting into that kind of realm, um, you have to be able to come to the table and, and be willing to walk away if you don't get the proper kind of things that you mm -hmm. need. And so the state kind of glommed onto this group because you've got to understand they're under pressure to build this. Um, and this group is supporting them. And so they use them as their conduits to sell the project. Um, we're, on the other hand, saying we would like to see the project and we understand there would be a consensus um, to probably go to Tufts University because people see the benefit for both Tufts and, and for some of the community. But there's mitigation issues around the project that have to be addressed before anyone um, can feel comfortable. I'm not going to buy a product unless I've seen uh, something that tells me what it's actually going to provide me. And right now the state is selling the candy, what I call the candy, but they're not talking about what the cavities may be. And so um, right now where the green line is, is the state can only afford to build to College App in Tufts University. Ah. And they also say that meets the mandate of the legal uh, SIP requirement, which we agree to. But again, there's no one really looking at um, the cost of the project, it's, as Dr. Wood said, it's, uh, they're projecting right now about a billion dollars. Um, and that has... Without mitigation. Without and mitigation. And we saw with the Big Dig how a billion turns into... Yeah, billion. well, the other thing about the Big Dig project is around the design-build model, which they used, which essentially the state, as I read some objective analysis around it, is that the state basically walked away from the management of the project, left it to Parsons Brinkerhoff, because they were the single contractor who went from engineering to construction to where we are today. And so that's what they're planning for the uh, Green Line. It's the same a similar thing? Is that contract. 
All right. And we've already seen it doesn't work. It well, doesn't and you've also seen that recently the MassDOT board turned down Parsons Brinkerhoff, the contractor. I didn't see that. We're working with uh, MassDOT. Actually, we're subcontracting a lot of the study work that we've seen so far with Parsons Brinkerhoff, and the public didn't realize this. Then the contractor came back recently to give them an extraordinary $24 million contract um, to start the preliminary engineering and build of this project. And that's when they ran into a public relations issue because everyone was saying, why are we awarding a huge lucrative contract to a firm who got us into the problem that we had with the big the dig, water leaks, the, the water leaks, and, and so and forth. And, and again, that, there was no accountability. It's accountability and conflict of interest, too. And that's an, brought up another question to us. We called the GLAM as GLAM. Oh, by the way, we're recognized by the federal government as uh, one of the only disabled groups in the country that is working on transportation. We're a major transportation group for disabled people because we have such a large disabled population in our group. So we looked at it and said, well, if this is an, an ethical problem or a accountability problem, is it accountability that the people who are doing the design and, and work, which are uh, employ where we considered employees of the state, wouldn't they need to file some form of uh, what do you call conflict it? of conflict interest, of interest problems, ethics problems? So we called the ethics commission. No, first we called the attorney general's office. Attorney general's office says, "Look, we don't handle that." It's uh, the Ethics Commission, but we agree with what the Ethics Commission will state. So we call the Ethics Commission. The Ethics Commission said, of course they have to file. Everybody else has to. What are they new for? So we set, get up at a public meeting, which I don't know if you were at that at meeting, but we were set up and said... I haven't been going to them. Uh, okay, so we sent them a letter and a publicly asked, are you going to file... A conflict of interest. They go back to their attorneys and say, their attorneys say they don't have to because they're not part of the state. Wait a minute. There's a person on that committee who has claimed he's going to do business with them. Brinkle, the, the same idea as the what they turned down. There's a person on the on there who is a designer who may an uh, architectural designer who may be wanting to do business with them. Excuse me, this conflict of interest could come down in five years when they really build this, and we could look back at this so-called transparency. So Carolyn came up with the idea, where is the change in DOT, the reform? This is supposed to be a reform. Reform to me means DOP more, Department of Transportation. Yes, reform means to me more transparency, more accountability, more openness. Instead, they circle around the wagons and say we're going to have less accountability, less transparency, and we are not going to let them uh, sign uh, uh, what do you call it sheets. Um, so disclosure disclosure seats for ethics violations. I mean, the, uh, and guess what? What do you do? The only thing you can go back and say is the ethics uh, the ethics committee uh, is no longer considered the ethics committee. That any state project gets to make up their mind what is ethically right and what is ethically wrong. It would appear that way. It would appear that it's, way. It's, and the reason that's important, Joe, is because, as I, and I kind of drive back to this point around the fact that the state is using land use design to justify um, what they call the reason for building the Green Line. Now, outside of just the lawsuit, but also in regards to building economic development. And what that means is that the state can come in anywhere along the Green Line and they can decide they want to put what they call transit-oriented development, which is called smart growth by other names. And they can decide they want to come in and purchase this property around the Green Line and, uh, and then sell it off to a developer to decide 
uh, you know, put a, either a large scale, small scale um, TOD, but the community loses its control around the density of what is happening. And Medford is getting grouped in with Cambridge and Somerville, who are both uh, high density cities. We're not high density, but they're using us in many ways to justify the ridership numbers um, with Tufts University. Now, they don't have the ridership numbers at Route 16, and, and the state's uh, analysts have already told us they don't have the ridership and they, and they, and that's to the justify. Program, Cal, right? yeah, the, the central program transplant. Does, the, the program they have to file, uh, the uh, report they have to file at the state is a SIP program. And the, in the program, it says well, there's no ridership at Route 16 to justify spending $100 million to go down that. A you bridge to, to nowhere. Yeah, a bridge. Yeah, not only that, but you've got to knock off three bridges that have been built in the last 10 years, 15 years. Well, you've got to do North Street, Windsor Street. Winthrop. Winthrop Street, I'm sorry. Winthrop Street and uh, College Ave, Boston Ave Bridge. That makes no sense. Now, there is an alternative. We went to um, uh, um, Reno, Calif uh, Reno, Nevada uh, to look in at their build of a same kind of idea. And they did a cap and cover. Uh, did you go out there? Cover, yeah, we yeah, went out we, there. We what went they did was they built, what, just like we have, they built it down a little bit more, cut it, cut and cover. I said it wrong, did I? No, you said it correctly. Oh, okay. Yeah. They cut down into the land, right, and depressed their railroad station so that it wouldn't be much of anything. They then covered it over with a uh, massive, uh, what was it, cap, cap, yes. cap of some kind. It was probably, uh, I, I, I don't know the material, but it was probably cement or, or concrete. And then they put air filters in different places throughout the thing. But the difference between that is the businesses and the university all put money in to help do it. Now, the biggest interest in this end stop is going to be Tufts University. Uh, Tufts University has, and I'm not sure what the money is left in their uh, fund since the downfall, but they're making money again. They don't put a nickel, but in the mitigation side, they're going to ask for a million and a half dollars to fix their buildings. Well, and then they will get the majority of that money because of something within the bill that small landowners, small businesses are not accredited with the same kind of uh, accreditation as Tufts University should get. Yet Tufts will not spend a dime. Now the question comes up, and which is asked publicly several times by two or three people, how much money does the transportation save for Tufts University? How much money on their budget? This, because they give free transportation to and from different parts of Boston. So it comes to they're going to make money, but they're not going to uh, put a nickel into the project. And you've got small... And then they're going to buy air rights. Yeah. You've got small business owners who are going to lose their business down in the Ball Square area on the uh, Medford sure. side. Um, there's going to be impact to others that are up there. In fact, one small businessman um, is sort of sandwiched in between, and they <coughs> haven't put him on the list of, around acquisition or mitigation. And so, therefore, we know it's pretty self-evident that when they build the station, it's going to be right up against him. He's going to lose parking in that Ball he's Square. at. Yes. Yeah, Ball Square. And that he will likely go out of business because you won't be able to really access him. So instead of mitigating him, they're leaving him hang out there. Now, we have a small business group that we have been working with and who have asked us to support them. By the way, and the, you should include this, Cal. They have never approached the small businesses along the route. They've never included them in meetings. Well, I'm not surprised. And they've never included them in the design and build stage that they are doing now design committee. And they the, refused. Yes. They dropped them off. And, not, and anyone who had anything to do with GLAM, they dropped us off. Even though we brought more than eight or ten studies to their view and said, look at these. You can't do it that way. 
You can't build a station without accessibility. There are new regulations starting, oh, excuse me, last week, 1st of uh, October, that start right now. So and they're still using the regulations of ADA that were 10 years old. These regulations have changed. They haven't even aware. They're not aware of the McGill study that says, come on, guys, we built these things in the beginning, and we don't see the real ha help for them. They don't do their homework. The only one that did their homework was the gentleman who did the, ri um, the, the ridership. ridership. He actually went out, checked out the ridership. Now they're fighting, uh, the people who support this, are fighting that he just was incapable. Uh, 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 he wasn't professional enough. He didn't do the because he actually went out there and found out the ridership. We was see that there. every day, Bill. I get two questions, but after you, yeah. what, what you were going to say? Um, well, we were uh, talking about the small businesses, and and the biggest issue we're fighting right now is that Mass uh, Dot and the station design work group that they handpick. Uh, which obviously are, are primarily advocates and transportation planners and land use uh, designers, is that um, they're focusing on the station design, which, as Bill mentioned, has a lot of issues around accessibility, but also they're keeping the focus off the build side. So once these 30%, uh, they get to a 30% design around stations, they're going to be moving into build, and the community's having no say or there's no transparency around that, even though we're trying to force the questions around mitigation. At some point, Joe, I mean, it gets to be that you've got to wonder um, around the cost efficiency around this. Now, from College Ave to Route 16, they put a worst case, what they call a worst case scenario on the table that would have cost the city of Medford almost $300,000 in property tax in terms of commercial businesses they were planning to take and uh, a lot of the mitigation of the housing along the way, which the mitigation um, is actually much severe from College Ave on up to Route 16. But they're not focusing on the build portion of this. And the community of Medford, um, I don't think Somerville fully understands the implications, although I think they're beginning to see that there's going to be a lot of land taking, not only for the transportation project, but for a lot of urban development. And for example, down in the inner belt, where they finally agreed on where they were going to ma uh, move the maintenance facility, mm -hmm. they have an 80-year-old family business that does uh, uh, wine and beer distribution that has 330 plus employees that they're Whoa. just going to take that right out to put the maintenance facility there because the city of, of Somerville negotiated that so they could do urban development over here. But they can't tell you how they're going to relocate that person, whether that business, whether they can. Um, but we're going to lose revenue as a state. But the, the business itself wrote, wrote them a letter and said, we need special permits from certain cities to do this kind of business. And we're not going to get them in any other cities. And that's why we want to stay here. Not only did they look, knock out out these 330, the state claimed there was only three employees there. And this is in, in writing now. Not only that. Three. Three. Out of 300. Out of 330. It's 1%. 1%. Oh, that's less than 1%. 1%, percent, right. So here you've got the state, who has, usually doesn't do its homework well, going in and saying, on one side of them, we're going to send people down to Route 16 for jobs. You know where Route 16 is, right? Oh, yeah. you all, how many jobs are down there, Joe? Two, three, maybe four. Well, if you get into Cambridge, you've got Ale Life. Yeah, if you go yeah. that way, but we're not anywhere near uh, Cambridge. Here so are my two here questions you, here you about go, that. No, wait a minute. You've only got one last thing. Not only were they going to knock out that, but at one time, and I'm not still sure that there still isn't in there, they were talking about taking Billy Cummings' property down on Boston Ave, which would have lost 300 more to 500 more jobs with a new business that just moved in. And Elizabeth Grady building they were going to take, yeah. which would have lost another couple hundred. But they got powerful lawyers. Yes. Well, they're fighting it. Of course they're fighting. That's why we have a delay. That's why some of them now has a delay, and everybody's blamed, started, tried to blame Medford, but once we blamed Medford, <clears> it, uh, they, it started to happen in some of them, and some of them actually did uh, t uh, create a year's worth of delay for them, because they didn't, the, some of the people didn't want it where they were trying to put the maintenance center. Now, 
Walker Brothers doesn't want it and to lose their brother, uh, their whole uh, business down there. And most of this is being driven by Somerville, who seems to be getting a great deal of money from um, the Patrick administration for a and lot Tufts of the Tufts University. They have huge um, development plans. I mean, pretty much they have a large urban development um, that they're putting on the table around Union Square, Somerville, which they're going to build a spur on the Green Line. Um, if you go to the MaxPAC site, which is across from the VNA, um, there's been a realtor who bought that property who completely has blocked, uh, knocked down a huge neighborhood there. A lot of it uh, had been old factories and so forth, but there's been a lot of issues around them coming in and redeveloping with a lot of condo units and on a, you know, on a sort of a two to three family neighborhood. And that property is owned in partnership by the uh, Smith family in terms of the Kennedy-Smith relationship. And the Patrick administration just recently gave them almost a $500,000 grant to help them buy access roads to the Green Line. So when you start to see this kind of development and you see this kind of patronage going on, this project is, is, uh, is something that the state will either pick up 50% of the cost through bonding, which means that there will be more interest forced upon the state taxpayer, or will be required to uh, spend 100%, which is the Patrick administration has promised they will do. So there's great implications to the state taxpayer. There's a question about uh, property owners and how they're being misused around land use development in these plans. And, and the fact that they're now spending about 200000 from College App to study Route 16, even though they know there's no ridership, um, and to try to develop land use design down there. And because Somerville juts into um, a, a portion of Medford in that Route 16 area, we're very concerned about how our quality of life is going to be pushed upon by this huge high density that Somerville is, is doing all over their city. Wow. And the, the state also has just put out a bid for $300,000 to study at Somerville's request how they would depress, um, like with the artery downtown, Callan. McGrath Highway. Carolyn, let, because there's, there's such a short time. We only have four minutes left. Okay. Because My two there's questions. such a time, we ought to just touch upon this parking issues. They're taking away parking for businesses that are still exist, may not be able to exist because they'll take parking away. There's traffic issues, and they've said the traffic is our problem, meaning the city of Medford. There's bus, buses can't go down and trucks can't go down Route 16. It's against the law. It means they'll have to change that or take the land at Mystic, on the Mystic uh, Riverside, take land over there to, re to rebuild Route 16 in that area. There's issues uh, of where they're going to put a, a parking garage to house the, the uh, cars that are going to come into the city to take the uh, Green Line extension. There's issues on how do buses uh, go from where to where, and uh, uh, are they going to stop the bus routes that are very, very well used right now and force them into the B busing uh, the buses into being coming part of Route 16. There are issues about people losing their homes. Uh, people. You know what I'd like to do after we air this. Yeah. I'd like maybe have you back as a part two because there's a lot more to cover. Isn't oh, there? there's oh, a it's great like deal more to great cover. And I had problems. two and questions then too. Go ahead. I'm um, sorry. The cut and cover you were talking about. Um, couldn't they build on top of things so that these businesses wouldn't be displaced? Yes. Maybe air rights. Yes. That's number one. Now my, my second question, maybe we can have a part two and talk about it. The Green Line, when it goes outbound, it splits off into three areas. How come we can't take these three other Green Lines that go out past... Oh, uh, oh yes, yes. ...past um, the Mass Ave there on the Turnpike... Um, yeah, Newton mental, and, and those yeah, areas. Yeah, but there's three of them that go up to Brookline and... Why can't you have the red line and the orange line branch off instead of building all this with the green line? Wouldn't it be simpler to have the other two split off and connect well, there, to Medford? There are questions about that. Yeah. We, we won't talk about them today, but, but yes. maybe in the future. But remember, this is not a done project yet. If the Good. public would understand that, and that the public that deals with you would ask them to force them to answer questions, we could get these answers for, for everybody. Do you have a website? 
Uh, yes, you yes, do. we do. It's um, oh, jeez. Um, Glam too. <laughs> it's uh, Glam dot Medford. Um, at tripod.com. Glam.medford at tripod.com. If you go into Google, do you put Glam Medford? Yeah. Uh, you can either use Greenline uh, Advisory Green Committee or Greenline Advisory Glam. Committee. Yeah. Greenline Advisory Committee and Bing or Google or all the web.com. Dr. William Wood and Carolyn Rose, it's, this is great because there's so much information. I'm still getting my mind around it. But you've helped clarify a lot of things for me today, and I hope for our audience. I hope so, too, Joe. And thank you for letting us come and talk. Oh, we, yes, no, this we is an issue, an important issue. And you people are great spokespeople from Medford. I appreciate all the work you do in our community. Great. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Joe. You have, and we appreciate you, too. And I appreciate Wincam and Joe LaRocca and oh, yeah, Carolyn. Joe. Two Carolyns and two Joes here today, and only one Bill. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe they'll make me pay something. <laughs> this is Visual Radio, and... Um, it's again it's october 9th, uh, 8th october 8th friday 2010 and, and i'd love to have you back here at wing camp we to talk to about green line again great thank you thank you i gave them the cut signal i hope they understand